Welcome to the Proven Principles Podcast by Knowing Hospitality, the show that deconstructs and demystifies the inner workings of the hotel industry. Here's your host, Adam Knight. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. My guest today is Sean DeVries. He's the founder of Open Pantry Consulting and host of the Open Pantry Podcast. Today's episode is a bit different format than previous shows. We're doing kind of a co-interview, co-podcast. Sean focuses more on food and beverage and restaurants. My focus is on hotels. So we figured why not bring it under one podcast and talk about the industry holistically and everything that's going on with this pandemic and how hotels and restaurants can best get through these times that we're in. So it was a ton of fun to put together. Sean's a great guy. I really hope you enjoy the episode. Before we get to it, though, if you haven't had a chance to leave us a rating or a review, I'd appreciate it if you just took a few seconds to do that. It really helps us put together better content and just makes this show that much better. So that's enough talking. Let's just get right to the show. Sean DeVries, Open Pantry Consulting. Enjoy. Good. There we go. Here we go. We're, this, is, this is happening. This is happening. This is 100% right, happening. <laughs> this is, I love this. I love this. Sean, <laughs> welcome to the show, man. It's great to have you. Mate, it's um, it's great to be on. Um, when you hit me up the other week when we started we started talking, um, yeah, like hotels is something I haven't really spoken to anyone about. As I said the other day when we had a we had a casual off the off the cuff conversation, and uh, the hospitality industry I know in both our countries are in massive trouble, and hotels from an area where I'm not from and know about was an area that I was even more worried about than restaurants. So it's, mm-hmm. I think this conversation we're about to have is going to be really important and insightful for a lot of people. So I appreciate us having yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I hope it is, you know, I mean, food and beverage is such a huge part of hotels in general, mm-hmm. whether you're talking high end fine dining restaurants, whether you're talking, you know, um, free breakfast buffet mm. in the morning as part of your room, whether you're talking banquets and events. I mean, this is, there's a lot that goes on in food and beverage behind the scenes and in, in, in hotels. And, you know, even moreover than that, there's a whole support team behind the scenes, especially for events where you've got event managers and sales managers and event coordinators and banquet captains on the floor. I mean, it really kind of mushrooms pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, I think we can cover a lot of ground today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. How about, um, why don't you give everyone the uh, kind of the, the Cliff Notes version of um, kind of who you are, where you're from, what mm-hmm. you're doing, how you got here. Cool. You know, that backstory. So I, um, I've been in the industry for 23 years now. Um, started out as a baker, wanted to be a chef. Um, worked, uh, worked as a baker's assistant, got to be a baker, then a, then a, um, then a manager at 19. Um, I had a um, had a boss at the time who owned a, a brand called a Baker's Delight, which was uh, you got uh, Canada has in in the form of Cobb's Bread, which mm-hmm. is um, the biggest bread retailer in the world, and started out with them super young, and he bought a second bakery and I managed that, and then uh, and then the company came and said to me at the age of um, just sort of sort of twenty one, uh, do you want to buy a business? And I did that and got got some money from my parents, luckily, and and mm-hmm. bought a bakery and try to make it work and, you know, do 80, 100 hours a week. Um, working really, really, really hard for sort of four or five years. And then um, the company came to me again and said, do you want to buy a second bakery? We've got one that we can give you at a, a really good price, Sean, and um, maybe you can work a bit less. Um, so I did that. <laughs> I bought a second bakery, had to refinance with another bank because my existing bank said, no, you're working too much and you're not making enough money. So we don't believe in you. So I said, sweet. So I've moved banks and um, uh, that was going really well. Um, unfortunately, I had a, had a, um, a relationship breakdown um, and and somehow got into a situation where I went out drinking with a mate one night and we got into a got into a, his car and, and had a high speed high speed car accident at 120 kilometers oh and um, wow. uh, into a tree. Right. And then so that that means my whole life's changed overnight. I um couldn't bake so my hands couldn't my hands physically wouldn't work um had all upper body injuries lower body injuries every kind of injury um uh, had to train myself how to walk again how to eat again all those kind of things um went back into the bakery sort of nine months after the accident around and um but it was too late i'd burned enough cash and about six months after that put everything into liquidation so that was sort of 11 years of my baking career gone 
I decided um, Bakeslight gave me the opportunity to go work in Canada for a little bit in Vancouver and, and help with COBS. Uh, I did that for a short period of time and, and came back. Um, worked for a coffee franchise. Then I worked for a burger franchise, which um, which is called Grilled. So they've got about uh, now they've got about 150 locations in in a, uh, in Australia uh, and in Bali, funnily enough. And um, and they're sort of high end kind of burger. So the healthy burger concept sort of came through here. Uh, so this was 2008, 2009. I started with them. Was then with six years in Brisbane and in Perth, if people know geography of Australia, opposite sides of the country. It's a bit like going yeah. from New York to LA. Yeah. Um, and uh, so finished up, finished up with them after six years, decided I want to live and work in Melbourne, which, which is arguably the, the food capital of Australia. Uh, don't tell people from Sydney and uh, <laughs> definitely the coffee capital. And um and wanted to live and work here. And that was five years ago. I worked for a couple of different QSR brands, um, ran a sourdough bakery brand for a year, um, which was incredible. Got me to link into um, uh, Heston Blumenthal's restaurant here um, and a lot of really high quality chefs like Neil Perry and um, mm. people people know the Australian scene. Um, and then the last sort of three or four years, I've had a consulting business, which has included a podcast for the last three years called the Open Pantry mm-hmm. Podcast. Um, and, and yeah, that's just been helping independent restaurants, um, either, uh, survive or thrive and, Mm. uh, and grow their businesses to, um, to be really strong operationally and, uh, and in turn be strong profitably. So that's, that's where it sort of sits. Yeah, (laughs) that's a lot. (laughs) It's, it's super funny. Like when people talk to me about my career and I actually verbalize it. Yeah. I go, wow, that, that, and even when I verbalize, it doesn't really feel like very much. But mm-hmm. then, then people go, that's a lot. I'm like, oh, probably is now. It's probably the point where it is. But, um, but the one thing I've never done is hotels. And I've always mm-hmm. been jealous of that because I'm quite hospitable. And um, mm-hmm. I always imagine myself as a concierge. Mm-hmm. And um, so tell me about how you got here, because I think that's probably going to be a more interesting story than mine for sure. No, I mean, Hey, well, we've got about the same amount of time in the industry. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. at uh, about 25 years now. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess before we go on, let's, we should say like, this, we're kind of doing a co podcast yeah, right now, sort of a back and forth. Like, you, mm-hmm. you know, I'll ask you questions, ask me questions. We'll just have a conversation mm-hmm. about the industry in general. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's, probably just to speak to some of the questions that may be asked of me, which usually doesn't happen on my show, but I love it. I, I always welcome questions. It's great. Super interesting, isn't it? What we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I actually, I grew up in Canada, uh, mm-hmm. not far from the Montana border. So those that kind of know the geography of North America mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, mm-hmm. I, my first job in hotels was at the Jasper Park Lodge um, in, near Ski Hill uh, in Jasper National Park in Alberta in the Rockies as a pot washer. I was wow. right out of high school. And the yeah. only thing I knew for sure is I didn't want to go on to, to university. <laughs> wanted to get out there and work. So somehow I got my, first of all, somehow my parents allowed me to move away when I was 17 to go do this, uh, this pot washing job. And you know, mm-hmm. that, that's a whole other story, <laughs> which I'm so thankful that they, that they signed me up for that or they, they allowed it. But um, yeah, it, so that, that is where I started. I worked a 7 PM to 3 AM shift. Um, you know, with uh, a bunch of guys right around the same age as me and all starting out, just trying to figure out where we wanted to go in life. And so that was, you know, those were really, that was a form- formative job for me. Um, mm-hmm. I got to experience a lot just in terms of, you know, I didn't even know what hotels were about. I just was looking for a job. And yeah. next thing I know, I'm in this, this, at the time it was a Canadian Pacific hotel, which was this, you know, strictly at the time was, was, um, within Canada, but you know, Uh it's this national brand of luxury hotels that caters to, you know, anyone and everyone, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. high rates, different level of service. It opened my eyes to things that I had never seen before. And all Mm -hmm. this was back of the house, mind you, let alone once you get out to the front of the house. Yeah. So I did that for a year. I moved back home, um, got a job as a bellman at a a hotel in the city I grew up in and then moved Mm -hmm. to the front desk, uh, about three or four more years go by. And if we figured it's probably time for me to go to school. So I applied to this hotel management program in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Yep. Uh, got into the program. I was the old man in the program at this point because I was 20, 23 
at this point. And this is, you know, there's a bunch of people coming, kids coming in out of, uh -huh. oh my God, right out of high school. So, yeah. uh, so that was interesting in and of itself. I already had a bunch of industry experience behind me at that point. So mm -hmm. the, the experience was good because it made it so much more, the learning was so much more relevant. I could see it tie back to what was going on in, in my real world um, mm -hmm. where I was working. Mm -hmm. So did that for a while, joined back up with, uh, with, Fairmont hotels, it became Fairmont at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then career took off. I kind of moved all over um, North America, uh, spent mm -hmm. some time in Calgary, moved to the US, went to the islands, Caribbean. Um, and uh, we kind of worked my way up the chain. I did, uh, I came up on the rooms side at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as I sort of hit the ceiling on rooms, was able to go over to food and beverage, uh, ran food and beverage division for, uh, for one of the Fairmonts um, in Seattle. Wow. And then uh, was able to get a director of operations job with the company down in Orange County, California. Mm -hmm. um, and then moved around a little bit at that level, ended up uh, running a couple of their hotels, uh, left the organization, moved over to St. Regis, which kind of, it, at that yep. point, it had been 20 years of Fairmont. So right. get to get a little more experience with another brand, did that, and then took on some independent hotels after St. Regis, um, all the way along sort of in, in leadership capacities and eventually topped out in the corporate world uh, as a VP of operations uh, for yeah. a, a regional uh, hotel company in California, which was a really great experience. Um, and so, you know, when I told the story of my career through uh, different conversations you end up having with employees, yeah. whether it's, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. whether you're interviewing people, whether you're doing onboarding or, or orientation, you know, it, it was just what happened to me and it doesn't sound that interesting like, to your point when you're telling mm. the story out loud of kind of how you came up. Uh, and then when you hear, you know, you hear it told back to you from other people like, Oh, you started as a pot washer and now you're yeah. a VP yeah. of operations. Yeah. How, operations do you, like, yeah. how do you square that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it was interesting to come up um, doing that. And, but all the time in the trenches, um, always in operations, always just on that treadmill, that instant gratification, yeah you know yeah um, that operations was, is was that deliberate did you always want to be, do ops because i'm curious what your no. what your answer is because <laughs> no I've always i didn't i taught 100 fell into it i uh, i had looked at going into banking at one point i had looked mm -hmm. at going into going to be a, a lawyer at one point um i kind of I, I never knew what i wanted to do but hotels were always the thing that i was able to fall back on mm -hmm. i always found myself like just i needed to get a paycheck so i was working in a hotel Mm -hmm. And 25 years later, here I am. <laughs> not a banker, not an attorney, <laughs> an operations guy. Because <laughs> you, because you're in, you're in Seattle now, right? So, yeah. like, the one thing during this during this crisis here is that in Australia, at least, um, restaurants have allowed been allowed to take away. I think what Americans call takeout mm -hmm. and um, and delivery. Uh, there's been some points where they've had people, you know, involved in uh, customers. I've been able to come in the restaurant at different levels and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, but the one thing about this crisis for me is I just thought hotels are in deep trouble. Like outside of, oh outside of quite a lot, we do hotel quarantine. So when people mm -hmm. come back from overseas, they have to go into hotel quarantine for two weeks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a whole nother story. But like, I'm not sure what's happening in, in America. Like how are hotels surviving right now? Are they shut down? Are they, are they semi-open? Like what are they doing? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I guess this podcast could go on as long as we want. Oh, it, to it could go very long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's the situation here for hotels is not good. Um, and it's, that's a blanket statement. Let me, let me start yeah. by saying that, you know, as, mm -hmm. as an industry, as a whole in North America, in the US in particular, is not doing yeah. very well. There yeah. are pockets that are doing okay. Okay. Uh, and those are some of the drive destinations. Those are some of the, uh, you know, the, the local vacation areas outside uh -huh. of major urban centers. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so, you know, you go to a beach or you go to the mountains, you stay in a I cabin, see. a luxury yep. cabin or something like that. Like that's, those places are doing better than others. Okay. Uh, but, but by and large, the industry is, is not doing well. Um, occupancy, actually, I pulled some stats here. So I, I prepared mm -hmm. for, <laughs> I'll be, I'll be for the, I'll, for the I'll show here. Stat for you if you like. <laughs> <laughs> so let me read some stats here. Yeah. Um, no, I, well, so the week ending uh, last week, so August mm -hmm. 1st. So mm -hmm. are you familiar? There, well, let me, I'll back up here. There is a reporting, an industry 
stats reporting agency called Smith Travel Research Star. SDR. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a report that, that just about every single hotel uh, subscribes to uh -huh. so that they can get data on what's going on in their market. And every okay. week, Star puts out, and I'll, actually what I'll do is I'll link in the show notes to this if anybody wants to see it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really good information. Mm -hmm. uh, every week, they put out national statistics on what's going on in the market. Mm -hmm. And they always compare it to the same period last year. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so now that, so with that out of the way, mm -hmm. uh, the week ending August 1st, so July 26th to August 1st, mm -hmm. national occupancy was 48.9%. That's well, down 34 and a half percent from the same time last year. So it's a big drop. Yeah. From the same period last year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the average rate nationally was a hundred dollars and four cents. Now that's down 25.3% from the same period last year. Well, wow. now okay. that it, it might sound like a low average rate, but you got to think this is taking every single hotel and every single segment, sure. every type of property, all, all in aggregate. Right. Yeah. So from high end to like holiday thousand right? dollar rate mm -hmm. to the $59 rate. So mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. that with a grain of salt, but it's just good mm -hmm. information to know, to see what's happening across the board. And I think if you dive deeper into the stats there, what they said is that the top 25 markets actually showed a lower occupancy and average rate than all other markets. So what that means is you've got the top 25 big markets, big, think big cities in the country here. Mm. All of those performed below the national average. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what that tells me right away is cities aren't doing well. It's some of these smaller outlying areas that's, that tend to be doing a little bit better yes. um, across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting just to look at you know how you know, what was going on in the industry leading up to where we are right now and where things are probably going to go with hotels as we move forward. Mm. Globally, at the end of 2019, there had been the most hotels and hotel rooms under construction ever. Really? It was a record by the end of 2019. Okay. Um, it was, what was it here? 15,000 projects totaling two and a half million rooms in various stages of planning uh, and construction across wow. the world at the end wow. of 2019. Huge wow. amount of hotel rooms. Yes. In the U.S., uh, it was the same. You know, every country mm -hmm. would have, or just about every country would have contributed to that. So it would have been a record kind of across the board. Mm -hmm. Well, the U.S., going into the first quarter of this year, it by the end of March, we had hit a record of 215,000 rooms under construction. And wow. in April, we had another record of 220,000 rooms under construction. Mm -hmm. And in May, that started to die off. What was interesting is that in April, when we hit that, that peak, that was the first month that we had these travel restrictions where everything shut down. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is that that's, th those numbers, they sound impressive, they are impressive, and it just would have kept going had this pandemic not happened. Yes. Um, that that's just an indication of a loaded system. Right. Those things, like a lot of those rooms, those hotels take years to plan. Yeah, and absolutely. Together and you got to get the deals and the site. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just a very complicated process. So mm -hmm. now we're starting to slow down, but you know, we don't know where this whole pandemic is going to end. Nobody does. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of people pontificating about it and I'm sure we're going to do that here today too. Yeah, of course. But nobody really truly knows how things are going to shake out. But when you look at some of the indicators of what's happening in the market here, you've got, business travel down across the board. You know, mm -hmm. here in Seattle, you've got Amazon who's got 35 or 40 something buildings here. You know, they, they've said that they're not traveling uh, by and large until mid-year next year. Google's saying the same thing. Facebook's saying the same thing. Amazon or um, um, all the, all the big, uh, Twitter, they're all saying Yeah, all the big the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then, you know, companies like Zillow and some of these other uh, real estate companies, they're all saying the same thing too. Mm. Um, so that business travel is not happening. And when those companies don't travel and others, you don't see the group travel, the, the, mm -hmm. the large. So rather than like one person from Amazon going to a hotel to do something, mm -hmm. sending a group of Amazon people to a hotel to do something. So, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. so that's not happening. Mm -hmm. And as we move through summer here, so kids are starting to go back to school probably yep. now-ish and then mm -hmm. through August and into September. Mm -hmm you know, that leisure travel is going to start to dry up. 
It mm. always does yes. every year. When kids of go course. back to school, people stop traveling. Of course. And so how, to, how hotels supplement their business in the fall after kids go back to school is mm. business travel and group. Mm. And then mm -hmm. that leads into uh, the Christmas. holidays, mm -hmm. Christmas, when and Thanksgiving here, when, mm -hmm. when things start to pick up again. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have this roller coaster through the year of different yep. segments. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're in budget season right now for most companies going into 2021, knowing that all of these companies won't be traveling. Yes. Knowing, you know, knowing that, that there, the spikes in leisure travel happen at certain times of the year. Mm. I don't mean to paint a bleak picture, but it doesn't take much analysis to figure out that we're in for a really long road here. Yes. You've got all this new supply coming on. Travel is down. Mm -hmm. Rates are down. Sure money's cheap. Mm -hmm. right? Rates are down. Mm -hmm. um, you just, so, so yeah. Anyway, long winded answer, but I think it's important to paint a broad picture of what's going on. Cause there's a lot of inputs. It's quite, it's quite, it's, 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 it's is meant to come out in a nice way. It's almost a blessing that all these companies have come out and said they're not going to travel because it, it gives hotel owners and corporations the ability to go, okay, we're really in trouble here. We've got all this market that we, we know when it's going to peak and all that kind of stuff. There's obviously triggers of when, how you can, how you can bring business in by price or by marketing or whatnot. But mm -hmm. It is a seasonal business, as you just said. But if all your business travel is going to be in trouble, that uh, I'm, I'd love to know what what percentage of business is in different, you know, in different hotels. I'm sure it's locational based, mm -hmm. but um, it gives the it gives those hotels the ability to plan and say, okay, well, we're gonna maybe we're gonna shut down five floors of our 15 floor hotel for yeah. this period of time and yeah. not service it, right? Mm -hmm. And downsize what we're doing, or I'm not sure. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's there's talk. I haven't heard of any actual regulations over here yet of of local, state, or federal governments mandating that occupancy in hotels is reduced to a certain uh, amount. So you know, mm. you can only occupy every other room, or a room has to be uh, right. vacant one night in between guests. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't exist. I just, I could be wrong, but I haven't, I haven't heard of that yet. Mm -hmm. um, even though hotels are practicing that. Mm, right. So they're, you know, they are leaving rooms vacant in between stays or, or having a room buffer in between yeah. two, two occupied rooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we were saying early on, there's a lot of people saying that 50% is the new hundred percent. <sighs> Meaning, you know, if yeah. you've got half your hotel shut down, then, you know, yeah. when you get to 50% occupancy, you're really at 100%. And maybe, maybe that's a good number. Mm. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of hotels can't survive. You know, their break-even point might be 60% at $100 a night. Right. Give yeah. or take. Yeah. Um, so if, if nationally, what did I say? We're at 49% at and uh, what did I say? ADR, $100 ADR. Uh, and 49% occupancy and the top 25 markets in the city or in the country rather aren't even hitting that, mm. you know, and there's no, I mean, there's, there's no indication that that's going to turn around anytime soon. Everybody's saying it's going to be three or more years until we get 2019 levels again. But I think that's optimistic personally. We don't even know wow. how things are going to change. Um, so, you know, we're starting to see a hotel, uh, bankruptcies and failures and, and and that's just going to move through the system um, you know as different types of loans and different programs that affect those loans kind of come in and out of service um, so there's yeah there's a lot of a lot of road ahead mm. a lot of bumpy road ahead for sure it's scary it's a bit it's a bit like a restaurant in the fact that with regards with hotels there's certain things you you can shut down but you can't fully switch off there's certain things that need to be operational, mm -hmm. like for a restaurant, that's a kitchen. Like that's always going to be largely the same running costs. You know, you can change obviously the variables of cost of goods coming in and stuff like that, but there are management costs that are rel relatively going to be the same. And, you know, there are factors that are going to have to run those venues, whatever they are, whether it be a hotel or restaurant, which are, you can't really change very much, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like what are you, so like, what are you seeing in the market um, from a, a restaurant perspective? I think, um, 
I think Adam, like we're, so I'm in, I'm in Victoria. So I'm in Melbourne, Victoria, which is, a, uh, is the hardest hit state at the moment as we take this in August uh, of the whole of Australia. So we, at the moment when we, when we're recording this, we're dealing with um, three to 400 new cases a day, upwards of 15 to 20 deaths a day. Um, where the rest of Australia might see 20 new cases or five new cases or two new cases and uh, thankfully no deaths. Um, to put it in context for people who don't know Australia and the market very well, like Australia as a whole with all states combined has about the same economy as California. Mm -hmm. So um, largely we had done quite well in this crisis, not well as New Zealand, but quite well as this crisis, um, crisis had evolved, um, except for the second wave in in um, in Victoria, the rest. So the restaurant industry went from being com obviously completely shut down, like everyone was in in March um, across the country, and um, uh, the ability to do takeaway and do and do pick up and do delivery. And then we were able in the 1st of June to do uh, the allowance of 20 guests with inside venues, as long as they, they uh, went with uh, one person per um, four square metres. So we deal in metres in, in Australia. Um, so it wasn't the 50% or 75% occupancy that I've seen in, in, uh, in America and California, uh, sorry, America and, and Canada, it's been a bit different. Um, so that was hard. If you had a big venue, like you still only were allowed 20 people. It was going to, it was about to get to 50, um, allowance. And then, and then we had this sort of change and we had this sort of second wave start to start and then it got shut down and went back to, back to, um, back to takeaway and pick up and delivery. Mm -hmm. So, so we had four weeks of people in venues and, and, um, contract tracing with every single person coming into venue and, um, uh, all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, and allowance of like one to one point five hours of people being in venues and then having to go and and to allow you know maximum throughput of people, um, and then we'll shut down again. So we've got we've got a state where I live that's really in trouble because we've had ten weeks of pretty much the same situation. We will have ten weeks of the same situation once we get out of this second lockdown. And other other states in Australia who are scared of the same thing happening as Victoria and therefore are reacting in somewhat the same way, like New South Wales and Sydney are, are revenue is way down in um, the other States. It's a bit better, but they're a lesser part of the economy. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit like comparing uh, Minnesota to California. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not really good variable. So uh, we've seen some, some closures of some venues already. And, um, and I think once our furloughed scheme here where the government is subsidizing wages for, for full-time staff and, and long-time casual staff um, finishes in um, March next year, uh, we're, in deep, we're in deep trouble. Those stop starts though are uh, brutal. They're so hard to deal with. Oh, they're mentally hard. Mm -hmm. They're emotionally hard. They're financially hard. Like it costs a lot of money to scale up, buy all this equipment, get your staff on board, mm -hmm. prep them, get them ready to go. This is what we're going to do. We're, you know, we're super excited, you know, whatever, <laughs> hopefully you are. And then, and then you're hearing things and like you're listening to the daily numbers and you're worried and you're hearing things and you're talking to other people in the industry. And then all of a sudden you shut within mm -hmm. 72 hours, you have to shut. And then you have to do something with the product, the produce. Mm -hmm. Um, and then clean down, shut down again, and you don't know how long. Like it was, it was supposed to be for six weeks, and we're now at, and we're now at four, mm -hmm. and it's going to go, and it's going to go for another four to five. Like it's so going to add two or three more weeks. On. Yeah, you already know that. So yeah. it's going to be a six week shutdown, and then halfway yeah. through that six weeks, they've said no, nah, it's going to be another six weeks. So it's going to be at yeah. least nine weeks, and even we're going, is it is it really going to be nine weeks, or is it going to be longer? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's um. Yeah. What's the, what's the number you're looking for? So everyone can go back to go back into venues. But like what's the yeah, number of daily cases? Right. You know, that's that's yeah. the interesting thing out of this whole scenario. Like, what's what's everyone comfortable with? Mm -hmm. 
so that we can go back to business. Um, Communication. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Like it's, yeah, it really is. Super hard. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I had this thought, uh, after you and I spoke, um, the other day with just regards to restaurants and hotels and, you know, I, we're going to probably at some point dive into, you know, what's going to change or what we expect yeah. to see change and, mm-hmm. and shed a little bit of light on that for people. But, you know, I came up in a world where, where you were graded on your success, not just based on how well your PL is, but, you know, we had all kinds of things that we put in place to make ourselves feel good yeah. or different rating agencies that would come in and, you know, we got, you know, this rating or that rating or this ranking or whatever. Yeah. You pat yourself on the back, you beat yourself up about it and you, okay, well, let's, you know, put in X, Y, Z yep. processes and, and, and training protocols and mm-hmm. we'll do better next year, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. Somehow that just seems a little like bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It kind of does. <laughs> Sorry to swear like on this, podcast. Better. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It's, but it does. I mean, there's so many other things right now that are more important than, than that stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the benefit that you get by focusing on those important items in hotels, I imagine restaurants, standalone restaurants are the same, mm. where you, you create this uh, culture of of teamwork and togetherness and people buy into a shared goal. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of camaraderie that kind of comes with going through something difficult. Like if you're trying to get a Michelin star, yes, that, that breeds, there's a lot of benefits to that, you know, personally, you've got, yeah. you know, you've, you've got some pride and the team comes together, like whatever, Even whatever exposure. those things are mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all of it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering, you know, just from your perspective, like, what do you what do you do as a restaurant owner with that? You got these shutdowns you're trying to manage, but you still want to do the best you can. Mm. What do you do? Um, I've been asking myself that for six months. I think I think it honestly depends on where your situation was before the pandemic. And the one thing about I'll be interested in your thoughts on a hotel industry, but my thoughts on the restaurant industry is that the, the brands that will survive this will either have a good amount of cash, but most importantly, a very good amount of brand. And what I mean by that is the fact that they were admired. They were seen to be doing the right thing. They were doing the right thing. Um, they cared about their team. They cared about their supply chain. They cared about their customers and that people loved them, right? If you were a restaurant, a restaurateur who underpaid your staff, who late paid your suppliers, who did everything to, you know, bring your customers in for different days at cheaper prices and didn't really care about your customers, cared about the dollar figure, then it's unlikely one that you're probably making money long term and two that you're going to survive. Because I think what this situation has highlighted is the people who are doing good and the people that are not doing so good in our industries. So I think it'll, it'll may take a while to play out, but I think the good people who have been doing a great job for each of our industries for a long time, much like people like yourself, Adam, and hopefully people like me will survive and will do very, very well because we do things for the right reason. We do it with empathy and we do it because we genuinely love the industry and connection. If what, I, what I've said on other podcasts and even on my own is that if your restaurant or cafe um, was trading year on year down post the pre-pandemic, then, it's, then you should stop trading and, and wind up your, you know, wind up your operations because unless you've got some panacea for the way that this is going to work um, po- profitably for the hospitality industry and you have a, great idea that no one else has thought of, then I don't know how you're going to trade positively out of this. Um, so you need the, to have the ability to have cash, um, either yourself or, or other people funding you, and you need to be able to pivot um, and understand that delivery will play a large part um, ongoing, whether you like it or lump it, delivery is going to play a big part, pickup is going to play a big part, at-home kits are going to play a big part. Um, 
what you guys call bodegas in America, what we call, you know, um, uh, grocery stores here. Mm -hmm. As part of brands will play a big part. Um, experience driven um, food will play a big part in people's homes and, um, and all that kind of thing. So unless you have the stomach for all that change, then it's probably best that you call up shop and, you know, you're, Adam, you're speaking to someone who's liquidated two businesses, who's done exactly that. I know mm -hmm. how hard that is. And it's a hard thing for me to say, especially because I know the emotion and the, um, the emotion and pain that comes with hospitality businesses, you know, if you have mm -hmm. to wind them up, like it's, it's incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's my yeah. thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's it's almost like uh, I, I like what you're saying, I, I, and it, it thought came to me as you were saying that is is you know a rising tide is going to lift. Yes, the uh, boats, right? All boats, mm. right? It's it's going to take not to use too many sayings uh, or euphemisms, but you know it's going to take a village, and mm. and people will help out the the restaurants that help them out or that are part of their lives or that, that are, you know, it's going to start in probably your neighborhood mm -hmm. and it's not going to go a lot further than that. You know, the idea of destination restaurants is probably going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you know, you're right. If you, if you take care of people, they will remember that. Yeah. And, and you're seeing that, right? Like the, like the rise of the independent restaurant coalition in, in America and, mm -hmm. and the, and the work they're doing to try and use with the restaurant act um, at the moment, like is amazing. And we've seen, you know, we've seen um, our associations, which were largely sleepy before this crisis, all of a mm -hmm. sudden have a voice at the table and lobby government. Like it's been super interesting to see. And, you know, the people that want to be a part of that for the right reasons. So, mm -hmm. um, but if, but if you weren't doing well when the times are good, to your point, mm. you really just have to, you really have to kind of look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, I, I, I shouldn't try to just keep this going no. for whatever the reason is ego or think being altruistic and thinking that you're giving people jobs or doing mm -hmm. whatever the thing is mm -hmm. um, because you're just making it harder in the long run. Absolutely. Like you're drawing out the paint, whether that be for mm -hmm. you or your staff. And I think unless you're on a really good lease deal um, um, with your landlord or, you know, and I don't mean that you're going to, um, they're going to forgive. I mean, they're going to forgive debt. I don't mean they're going to push debt down the road and you're going to pay it on a balloon payment at the end. That's not right. Winning. Right. That's, right. that's just going to make the pain worse at the end. Yeah. You know, so um, you, you really need to have own, open conversations with, you know, uh, with your team, with your suppliers, with your landlord, mm -hmm. with your, with your family. You know, mm -hmm. those are all important. Oh yeah. But, but what about the hotel industry? Like, like what are, you talked about independent helping independent restaurants before uh, independent hotels before mm -hmm. like do you think those kind of independent hotels which are so driven by you know an elevated experience and something that's very different from going to park regis or or ritz carlton mm -hmm. or, or whatnot like do you think do you think that's gonna do you think they're gonna survive adam uh, you know, that's a really good question. I think we still don't really know how that's going to play out. The independent mm -hmm. hotel world is, is interesting because it covers the same depth. I was going to go wide, but it covers the same depth as the branded hotel world. And what I mean by that is you've got, just like you have limited service and full service and upscale and upper upscale and luxury branded mm -hmm. hotels. And we all know mm -hmm. the brands. Yes. You have the same in, in the, in the independent world. Um, and, and so they're not necessarily better positioned or in a worse position than the branded properties are because it's still to a certain extent, a geographic play. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you've got an independent hotel in a local, at least right now in a local vacation market, um, and just like you were talking about with restaurants, you're connecting with your guests and you've got some interesting programming and you, you are a part of the community. You're not just another building where people sleep, but like, you know, you, you're, you're philanthropic and you participate in city events or county events, whatever they are, or, you, yes. you know, you, you're a part of the, the charitable fabric of the neighborhood that you're in. You're going to be at least in a better position from a, 
brand um, uh, recognition or, or respect. I'm not really sure what the right term is there, but yep. like yep. you'll have more goodwill in mm-hmm. your. So mm-hmm. I think that that'll play out really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you're in a city center hotel like Seattle, I'm literally looking at my window right now and there's nobody downtown. It's empty. Um, it's pretty sad. So, and you know, I've got an independent hotel right across the street and I've got a branded hotel another block away and I can see them both. Uh, it, neither of them have anybody in front of them right now. Yeah. Well, well, so yeah, I think, uh, I think the principles still apply. Same as what you're saying with, with restaurants, it's going to be the same with, with properties. The ones that are run really well, that are smart, that, uh, can adapt, to what's going on right now. And, you know, hotels are funny because the industry sticks on these points about always wanting to have sort of enough under your roof that uh, as many people as possible can get what they want. So okay. try to be all things to all people. Okay. Um, and so a good example of that is, you know, a hotel that has a restaurant that is, not not it doesn't not only does it not make any money it, it's it's a it's a cost center for them yeah this happens across the board yeah. where you know it'll the restaurant is an amenity it's not a revenue center mm. and so you know hotels will have these amenities in place because you know they want to make sure that they're providing enough breadth of service to the guests that are staying right. uh-huh. in the building yeah in spite of the fact that it's losing money Yes. That is 100% going to change. There's no doubt in my mind. Now, what do you do with that space? I don't know. Because, you know, do you turn it into a banquet space? Do you turn it into co-working space uh, for, you know, people in the city to come in? Mm. Um, You know, because, you know, if people are still coming downtown, but they can't go to the office, maybe they come to your hotel and they rent a desk for a couple of hours and they can, you can provide them with minimal food and beverage service. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, I I think something that's certainly viable in some of these restaurant spaces in hotels that you close down. Um, So, you know, that's, that's, that's still yet to play out, but because, I mean, again, a lot of hotels are still closed and mm. they haven't even opened their restaurants yet, some of them. So because of the restrictions mm. that are going on, they haven't even opened the restaurants, even if the hotel right. is open. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's a lot. Do you think we've, <clears throat> you said before about, you know, 15,000 properties under construction, um, which is just a, a mind blowing figure, right? When you think about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. two, and, two and a half million rooms. That's just unbelievable. Um, do you think some of the larger chains, like you've obviously been involved in larger chains, that, that they will see those as just proper, that is just property mm-hmm. and they'll just go, okay, well, we don't want to make that a hotel anymore because we know that hotels aren't going to be, maybe not be viable for the next three to five years. So we're going to make that into, a, we're going to sell that as apartments. Mm-hmm. Do you think, do you oh, think I- that kind of thing is possible? 100%. They're already seeing that happen. There's stories right. coming out about hotels in New York in particular that are going right. to go yes. um, condo uh, or turn into office towers. And I don't know who needs office space right now. <laughs> office but, towers is the know. stupidest thing. <laughs> yes. But yeah. it's happening. Mm. Uh, look, the uh, not to oversimplify the, the, the real estate side of hotels, yes. but as a general rule, some of the larger, more um, trophy properties you can right. call them trophy properties. Yes, uh, yeah. are usually owned by larger institutions. It's it's re, it's very rare to have, uh, you know, a Four Seasons hotel owned by an individual. It happens, but it's super rare. And yes. you know, you can yeah. just do a quick Google search to find out the, bil- the the billionaire that owns that, yes. that Four Seasons. You'll yes. know. <laughs> so, but the reason I say that is that you know these companies will have the ability to finance. Like they can burn cash longer. Sure. Basically. Sure. Sure. Uh, whereas, you know, a smaller independent hotel usually owned by uh, a couple of investors, maybe it's a mom and pop operation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, that's a whole other story. Yes. Yeah. You know, they don't have um, the, the ability to just, just float that business mm-hmm. for months on end or, mm-hmm. or potentially years on end mm-hmm. without some dire consequences. Mm. Do you, do you think that um, largely what we're seeing with airlines at the moment will probably be a consolidation of airlines, whether that be um, some just go completely bankrupt 
or you know there's you know american airlines might buy three more airlines in, in america i'm not quite sure um do you think that'll happen with hotels is that already happening like a big chain buying out a couple of the smaller chains it's already happening right um wow. yeah it's been going on for a few years now yeah. um you know the the big one that happened a few years back was when marriott bought starwood and right. so they've got something like 35 brands um under their umbrella now under the marriott umbrella um, IHG is no different. Um, mm -hmm. Hyatt Hilton, no different. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're seeing that now for sure. Okay. Um, it's hard to see how, you know, one of these big guys is going to buy another one of the big guys. Yes. Um, it could happen. Everybody would have said that there's no way Marriott would buy Starwood and it happened. Right. Uh, so right. it could absolutely happen. You know, I don't necessarily see what the benefit would be to to go from 35 brands to 65 brands under yes. your control <laughs> because, because nobody's traveling. So yeah, of course. What, what's, what's, the the, what's the point? Yeah. Unless yeah. it's going, it's get, unless it's going for a penny on the dollar, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. If, yeah, if you get into a position where you can, you know, the company's going to go under and you can get all of that mm. and all the assets there for super cheap. Yeah, of course. But mm. like just as a, as a transaction, um, that's probably going to slow for a little while. Is it, question that has nothing to do with what we're talking about is there a reason why if if i'm if i'm marriott and i'm buying starwood and they've got 35 brands hotel brands that i'm keeping those 35 brands and i'm not just doing one brand or five brands like i can imagine it's co it costs a lot of money to continue all the all the assets for those particular brands even though the cost mm -hmm. to obviously change over all the all the logos and all the blah, 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 or the right. paraphernalia, which goes in hotels at the start. But right. there's a reason why they just keep all the brands live. You know, that's a really great question. And what I've, what I've come to, because I've asked myself that, and I've talked to a lot mm. of people about the same thing over the years, and we fully yeah. expected to see when that transaction happened, a lot of brand consolidation, because uh -huh. it seemed like there were many brands that were competing head to head with one another. Yes. And the way that it's played out in the last few years, and you know, obviously what's going on now, probably whatever best laid plans were in place yes. at the end of 2019, yeah. we'll just push those off for a few years, uh, is that when you have all these brands, they literally suck all the oxygen out of the market. Mm. So they have a price point at every single place all the way up the chain. Okay. So if you're looking for a $60 a night hotel, or $65 or $70 or an $80, $100, $120, $120, they have something for you mm -hmm. all the way up. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's an interesting strategy because you, you, there's no reason to, to go stay anywhere else, especially if you have the credit card. And you have that, you know, and if you work for a company that sends you on business travel, and so you, I know a lot of people that, you know, they would stay uh, through work travel with, Marriott hotels, they'd mm -hmm. bank all those points. And then on vacations, they, their vacation would be covered. At least their accommodation would be because they'd use the points and <laughs> yes. stay at a Marriott when they go to wherever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, that's a, that's a strategy that's very clearly worked for them. Mm. Okay. How are you dealing with this yourself? If I can ask you. <laughs> like, uh, like, good. You see, you, you try to stay <laughs> You see, it's spite of, from a couple of hotels, right? Like it's pretty, yeah. Pretty in, in spite of the, Adam. in spite of the tone of uh, the podcast here, which I didn't mean to have it such a so kind of down, down yeah. like a downer show, which I don't think necessarily is a bad thing. It's just the reality of what's going on. Mm. Um, you know, I'm trying to stay positive through it all. Uh, I'm trying to see where I can help hotel managers mm -hmm. through the pandemic, mm -hmm. through these issues. And I think the best way that I can do that is at having as much clarity as I can on, on everything that's going on that might affect their hotel. Right. And I don't mean, I don't mean granular understanding because that you got to dig into a property to get like really in the weeds about what's going on, yeah. which I absolutely do. But I think, you know, just at a high level to have conversations with people about what's going on in the market, 
and what is likely to happen based off of experience from previous years. Just mm -hmm. like we started off the conversation saying, kids are going back to school. We know every year that leisure drops off right around this time. Yes. And hotels survive with you know, business travel and group travel through the mm -hmm. end of the year. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's a constant. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, having those conversations to say, okay, we know that this is gonna happen. So how can we best prepare your business to deal with the thing that is usually there that isn't going to be there this year. What are we going to do? And so it forces everybody to start thinking about things a little bit differently. Um, and, you know, I said earlier that hotels are um, slow to change. Like mm. it's like turning a cruise ship sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the successful hotels are going to be the ones that are willing to break the mold a little bit. They're willing to be nimble really? and try new things and try to try to be outside the box and do things we love, especially in the branded world. My God, we love to say, oh, that doesn't fit with our brand. We don't do that. That's not, that's not us. <laughs> yes. You know, so because we're the, yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. if you, if that is the hill you want to die on. Yes. Okay. Go for know, it. Uh, mm -hmm. Go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is just not going to fly. No, mm. you have to be willing to try all kinds of things. And we're seeing really interesting uh, especially in food and beverage, really interesting concepts come out of, of hotels. Um, one of the most interesting things that I heard of was a hotel that their restaurant, they weren't able to serve guests, but they hadn't shut down yet. Okay. And rather than, no, that's not true. Let me, let me backtrack. <laughs> okay. they were, let me backtrack because that doesn't make any sense what I just said. So, they, they, they were shut down, but, but as a way to keep the restaurant going and the people working uh, is to sort of be part of the essential business world mm -hmm. when all of this kicked off. Yeah. They worked with their suppliers, uh, knowing that all the stories back five or six months ago were that there were shortages in food in the stores and cleaning supplies were yes. short and, yep. and you know, paper towels and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, they worked with their suppliers and turned their restaurant into what was effectively a grocery store. Mm -hmm. People could come in and get essentials to take home with them mm. uh, if they lived within a certain radius of the hotel. Yeah. And I think that kind of innovation is brilliant. Yes, it, absolutely. You, you already have all the infrastructure. You've got yeah. the suppliers, mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff comes in large format. Yeah. Um, and you're yeah, helping economies your, yeah, yeah, helping, the community. Mm -hmm. helping the community. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that is going to sustain hotels and hotel restaurants and, and standalone restaurants as we go through this, that kind of thinking. Do you think that's few and far between? Do you think, do you think many hotels are going to think that oh, yeah. way? Yeah. No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I why do, why so. do you think that is though? Do you think, <laughs> do you think that's just well, because they just, they just, stuck and there's like no 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 we're just gonna write it out no, it's Adam, really I hard i don't care we're just gonna write it out it'll be fine it's really hard to see the forest through the trees yeah, yeah. uh it's really hard to be creative and and imaginative but also have the operational chops to pull it off right you can come up with all the ideas in the world but if you can yeah, if you can't, can't execute, execute mm. it means nothing right mm -hmm. so you got to find that rare mix of, uh, of, of an idea person and an execution person. Hopefully, yes. uh, hopefully, you know, those two. Yeah. I mean, Hey, great. It'd be great if it was one person, uh, but, <laughs> but hopefully you've got those, those couple, three people on your team that can do that. Mm. Scary talk. A little bit, a little bit. Um, <laughs> hey, so in that though, you know, from your side, what do you mm. think, we should be focused on in restaurants right now. You know, we've got, so we've got kind of covered what hotels should be looking at innovation. How does that translate into the restaurant space? I think uh, I hate the word omnichannel, but I think so many, you know, so many brands now have to just know that the long haul of this situation is going to be that their brand, their, their restaurant income is going to be separated into, um, into an at-home experience, into an in-store experience, into a takeaway model. And they've got to understand if they can make, you know, make money on that. This is a great time to think about what kind of, what kind of staff you actually need with inside your business. Um, 
do you have the ability to do a, a dark kitchen model um, on the other side of town? Is that going to work? Is your brand strong enough to actually lead across, you know, across the city? Um, you just, you have to look at everything you're paying money for mm. and figure out if it's worth it or not. And that might be, um, you know, that might even be uh, your supply chain, you know, do you, uh, there's certain things in your supply chain that you don't need to pay premium for. Are people going to pay that um, at the moment? I'm not talking about, you know, going back from free range things or doing unethical things in your supply chain. I just mean, you know, uh, what are people going to buy in this, in this time? Because I think when the government subsidies, whatever country you're in, what's going to change is that people will shop hotels and restaurants less they will care about the experience so much more. It'll need to be elevated. It'll need to be personal. It'll need to be individual. And that doesn't matter whether you're um, a fine dining, a fine dining restaurant or a quick service restaurant or a premium fast casual restaurant, or, you know, for yourself, if you're the holiday Inn or um, uh, the four seasons hotel, the experience needs to be good. So you need to think about, you know, what, what costs are going to, are going to bring that experience for, for customers. And you need to think about how that's going to be different. I think tech is going to play a large role in both of our industries in, in, mm -hmm. in how that's going to um, save brands money, whether that be, you know, ordering systems like I'm working with a tech company here at the moment where customers use QR codes and menus and, and, and pay, for themselves rather than have someone come to the table. Um, I think you'll see a who, lot more who, automatic check-ins. In, who would have uh, thought like this. that this time would have been the rise of the QR code? It's like, oh it was too, God. it was too early when it came out, when, however long ago, that was a decade ago, but now yes. it's, it's everywhere. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like everyone's realized what Asia has been doing for the last 10 years. Like it's, it's, <laughs> It's, it's quite, I mean, obviously Apple changing, changing their iOS to make it that you can just hover over a QR code that pops up and you can go into it was a game changer yep. for QRs. But the fact that the fact that customers can actually now sit at a table and order from a QR code and literally don't have to like do this with a, you know, do this with a, um, to get a wait staff to come over is yep. um, to take an order is amazing. Or I don't have to wait behind 15 people to go and order at a, order at a order at a counter um which you know i used to be the person taking your order from qr restaurants for over five or six years doing that um i know how irritating that is but you know mm -hmm. and and i'm sure hotels there are there are economies of uh, scale there as well where you'll see some changes with tech so you know but the challenge is going to be around that is there's going to be less employment and mm and um or a redistrib at the very least a redistribution of employment within inside yeah. our sectors and that's that's really tough to deal with. So I think I think you've got to be just open to change. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to be have your listening ears on. You've got to listen more than talk. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think you've got to really think about what your brand stands for mm -hmm. and what customers are going to buy. You know. Yeah, I think you know you you mentioned earlier, and I agree with you completely about the restaurant owner that hasn't been having a great go of it for a while now and needing to shut it down. You know, I would give that exact same advice and, you know, probably look at it first, like myself too, uh, yeah. somewhere down yeah. the line, you know, mm. maybe, maybe not, you know, we'll see how this, uh, uh, this thing plays out. Uh, but, you know, look in the mirror and, and see, you know, is, yeah, you love hospitality. Yeah. You love restaurants and, and food and beverage and, and whatever, Mm. Uh, and, but you know, is it time to look at going into another industry? Uh, mm. and, you know, there's a lot of industries right now that don't seem to be affected by the pandemic. Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, so, you know, look at I, my wife's in advertising. So, you know, mm -hmm. that, that definitely, Um, you know, and we've got some friends having lived in San Francisco for years, have some friends that work with Amazon. You know, we've all heard the stories about how many job oh, wrecks they've got open and they're bringing people on. Um, so, you know, maybe it's time to look at some of those other industries and there can be offshoots of hospitality uh, in, in those different industries. Agreed. Actually, now that I say that out loud, one of the things that I have 
heard quite a bit about is that people going to do exactly that, mm -hmm. but not seemingly qualified for the job that they're applying for because they don't have direct industry experience in that. Yes. They've got all of this great hospitality experience, yes. which I would argue is the best experience to have for right? Oh my God, just about <laughs> anything. Uh, but you've got to be able to articulate that. Yes. What is the thing that you can pull out of what you've been doing in hotels or restaurants for the last mm -hmm. five or 10 years That's a good point. and translate that into, you know, going to work for, I don't know, go be a, a real estate agent or go mm -hmm. be a, a banker, I don't, I, whatever your thing is. Yes. Um, I promise you that those transferable skills are there. Mm -hmm. You just got to put some time and energy into figuring out what those things are and be able to articulate them. Yeah, I totally agree. Have, have you thought about, if I can ask you, have you thought about coming out of the industry? Because I have. Yep. You know, yep. and I've, I've sure. really, you know, taken some, taken some real hard conversations myself and I've thought, you know, far out, do I need to, do I need to still, is this, is, is my time to come out and go do something else? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be uh, practicing what I preach if I had just <laughs> stood on my soapbox for, for two minutes. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. I've thought about it. I don't think that that time's yet. Um, I hope that that time Never doesn't comes. happen. You know, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm working hard every day to try to, um, pivot and, and, and understand what's going on and, and be able to not just produce content, but, but give, uh, guidance and operational support to hotels to help them through this. Yes. Um, yeah. and you know, as long as there's hotels that are operating, I'm going to try to be the person that is there to help them get through this. Mm. So we'll see how that plays out. Should we end on a positive note? Let's do it, man. I've got a good question that I've been using with my guests in recent times. So I'm curious, I'm curious of what your thoughts are. Okay. What is the one thing that you are looking forward to doing post pandemic that you miss that you can't do now? That is a fantastic question. Uh, I use, man, we have all been thinking about it. <laughs> it's, it doesn't make you realize what you really miss and what you're thankful for. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like walking outside without a mask. Like that's going to be, <laughs> uh, I do miss that. <laughs> I would, you know, I, it's a few things. Uh, I had this experience a couple weeks ago where, uh, I went to another part of Seattle and, uh, was walking around right around, um, it was, I think it was like 6.30 at night. Mm. And this is when restaurants just started to allow people sitting on patios again. So they, so okay. they started to reopen, mm -hmm. uh, not really anything going on inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and I heard something that I hadn't heard for a while, and that was dishes clanging. Yes. And, you know, just, just the activity and the buzz mm. that mm -hmm. a restaurant has. And that, mm -hmm. that's intoxicating, right? Yeah. If you've been in the industry... You know, I know, there's just something about that. There's something comforting about it. Yes. Uh, and I heard that and I'm like, man, I just, I can't, I can't wait for that noise to be around again. Mm -hmm. For that's just to get back to, mm -hmm. to this, uh, mm -hmm. to what we were six months ago. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we never will, but you know, and then we'll just have fond memories of it. But uh, yeah, it was just that it was, it was the energy in a busy restaurant or in a busy hotel. Uh, yeah. Or in the yeah. City. Um, and then the other thing is just stability and predictability. Um, you know, let's, it'd be nice to get back to the, uh, at least in the, you know, in the hotel world, you know, you kind of know how your year is going to go and you've got these milestones through the year of, you know, yeah. this event happens and then this and then this, that. And this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and then you repeat it next mm -hmm. year and repeat mm -hmm. it next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we'll get back there at some point down the road. Uh, it's going to be a very different industry though, by the time we get there. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. How always, about you? Um, you? You stole my thunder. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like being in a, being in any kind of you know restaurant or bakery space. You know, because I'm a baker and um, talking with chefs or bakers about about things that are happening and 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 feeling that buzz on a on a Friday night or a Saturday night and it's full and people are bustling and people don't care that they're being tapped or hit or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just that I call it the rhythm of hospitality, right? Like it's just mm. that, it's just that rhythm. And yeah, I miss that. I feel, I feel like I feel I feel like I'm not whole at the moment, and that's a really weird feeling. Yeah, because I don't I don't have the industry that I love actually functioning how 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 it can. So yeah, 
No, I hear you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, one one last question. Yes. On my end, you can. Yes. We can go on for another hour if you. Want to <laughs> no, one more okay. on my end. Please. Uh, okay, so something again. I ask everybody at the end mm -hmm. of uh, my show here. Mm -hmm. What's the one thing from your perspective that people could do right now that would give them the most bang for their time and energy? The one thing they could do. I even I even prepared for this question in my head, Adam, and um, and it's hard because we've talked about so much. I think the one thing they could do, and you're probably not going to expect this, is look at themselves as a leader and figure out if they still want to do what they what they're doing right now. Mm. Um, I think a lot of restaurateurs would have allow themselves to be busy working 80 to 100 hours a week like I used to for a long period of time. And people do that for a lot of different reasons. Um, some because they want to escape everything else that isn't involved in their restaurant. Um, the other one is financially they have to do it. But I think they need to look at themselves as a leader and figure out if they still want to do this. And if they do, then they'll be able to pivot in whatever way they want as long as they've got access to the capital and the people that they that they can do to execute it. So I would say that's the biggest bang for their buck because that would allow them to see what they want to do, whether that be inside hospitality or not. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I like the way you framed it around leadership because, you know, leadership sometimes gets, it's a bit of a misnomer with people. Sometimes I think it's just about cheerleading and and creating a strong culture and getting, mm. you know, all, yeah. And th yeah, those are elements to it, but it's also about making the hard decisions. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, and this is definitely one of those times where you've got to take stock and, uh, and potentially make that hard decision and just be prepared to do that. So yeah, I like that. Have you ever answered that question for your guests for yourself? Have you ever had anyone turn that back on you? What would you say? Uh, no, 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 I have actually, no, I haven't. Uh, and you know, my, the shows tend to be, um, uh, topic specific. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, I just did one before this with an attorney who talked about, um, the, the laws around mask usage. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Which is, which is a relevant topic Great in podcast. the U S here because, uh -huh. yeah. because, we have to hear for some well. reason there's a lot of debate about it so it's yeah, great to it, and a lot of just mm -hmm. you know discussion about whether or not there you know Effective. there are laws in place to do that so oh, it was a okay. great I yeah see. and if that's if that's actually a thing uh, because mm -hmm. you know anyway it turns out there's not um <laughs> so <laughs> but no no i haven't i guess anticipating your next question yes yes <laughs> <laughs> so what's the what's the one big takeaway What's the one big takeaway? Uh, you know, for me right now, it is for anybody in a position to be able to make uh, a decision or a call about something. And so that could be, you know, at a supervisory level, management level, department head, mm -hmm. all the way up to owner. Mm -hmm. um, get out of your, your self-imposed box mm -hmm. about how you think things should be done where you work. Yes. And think about what it is that's going to provide value and meaning to your guests. What is going to make that experience better for mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. to create that goodwill to get them to come back or at least get them to talk about the great experience they had and put a nice review up online for your hotel. Yeah, absolutely. That's crucial right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not an easy thing to do, but you, you, you got to exercise that muscle it's if gonna, you want to survive. It's going to rinse and repeat. Yep. Absolutely rinse and repeat. Yep. Um, Adam, this is, this is so cool because we've done, we've done a co-podcast and it's my first co-podcast, co co even though I can't say it. Um, so usually at the end, I would say like, Adam, how can people find out more about you? So I would ask that question. <laughs> uh, yeah. If people want to find out more about me, you can go to this podcast website, mm -hmm. theprovenprinciplespodcast.com. 
Awesome. My company website, knowinghospitality.com, mm -hmm. uh, where the podcast also lives. You can find it there too. Okay. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, my email address is adam at knowinghospitality.com. Super simple. Super simple. Super simple. Try to keep it simple. How about you? How do people get a hold of you, Sean? <laughs> oh, I didn't anticipate that question, Adam. Um, <laughs> uh, pretty simple. If you, if, you, um, if you search for the Open Pantry podcast, um, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and uh, it's in all the, all, the good, all the good places that you listen to podcasts. Um, or if you look for my company, it's openpantryconsulting.com. Um, mm -hmm. obviously I deal with, um, independent venues and, and, and chain venues here in Australia, largely in Victoria. Um, but, um, uh, I feel so blessed to, to know so many people around the world like yourself and, uh, in Canada and America and, and UK. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really good. And I appreciate, I appreciate us having this conversation because, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, and we, and I should say before we wrap is that mm. obviously this podcast is going to be on, uh, on the proven principles podcast, yes. but you're going to post it on uh, yes. open pantries, well. open pantries as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a super interesting conversation because I, I don't, I don't talk about hotels and, um, and this is, um, made me really want to talk about hotels a lot more because, you know, a lot of amazing restaurants are built out of hotels and, yeah. and hotels have built so many amazing chefs and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, look, I hope that continues post this crisis. Me too. Me too. Adam, this has been fun, so much, Sean. Man. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay, Peace. take care. Thanks everyone for listening to the show today. If you want to get in touch with Sean, learn more about his company, or listen to his podcast, the Open Pantry Podcast, head over to his website, openpantryconsulting.com. As for us, you can find us at knowinghospitality.com. We've got a ton of resources and past episodes that hopefully help you through what is going on in our industry right now. If you like today's show, please drop us a line. If you want to see more formats like this, I'd love to hear from you. Until next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Proven Principles Podcast with Adam Knight. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. The podcast is brought to you by Knowing Hospitality, a full-service hotel management company that puts your performance first by rethinking the management model. Visit knowinghospitality.com to learn more. Until next time.